Thanks for inviting me here. This is a great workshop. Um, it's good to get back and meet everyone uh, after a few years of collaboration. OK, thank you. Lots of tech here. I feel, I mean, I'm, I'm in the tech capital of India, so I feel like it with all this. Uh, okay, so I work on uh, ocean turbulence. Uh, I mean, I, I have a, a very pleasant history that goes back a few years uh, with folks in the room here, uh, uh, including uh, Debasis and uh, obviously uh, some of my US colleagues. And um, we've been fortunate to fly a number of these gliders um, in various studies in the Bay of Bengal over the past several years, starting with Asiri. Uh, I'd like to introduce Justin Shapiro, for those of you who haven't met him. He joined uh, the research team at Hui, I think officially about a year and a half ago. Um, he has a long history working in the field, uh, in particular on not only gliders, but very specifically this platform. I, I think he was one of their, uh, he was a high level engineer at Web Research before I rescued him. Uh, okay. And uh, as Scott introduced yesterday, I am actually um, sliding into a slightly different role for the forthcoming year to year and a half or so as an IPA at ONR. Uh, so the main goal of my presentation is to impress my new boss, Scott Harper. Yeah, I'm already failing. Uh, so my research interests, um, okay, great, thank you. Um, this is a summary slide of stuff that, in particular, Simon has hinted at uh, and, and talked about. I'm going to kind of reiterate it from the subsurface side of things. And it's a problem that has to do with um, when you get strong heating in the tropical oceans, um, you can form, you know, diurnal layers. Uh, and there's some semantics there that I happen to know Eric DeSoro doesn't like, but uh, basically, uh, some form of stability enhancing mechanism is useful for that. And so the two ways to do it are A, diminish the winds so that you're not disrupting the surface stability during the day, or B, freshen the water so that you're putting a pre existing layer of stability on top of which the sun can beat down in heat. Um, and I'm going to show kind of an interesting phenomena that we've certainly observed in the tropical Atlantic, and I think we're in a good position to observe in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, just as a, uh, an intro, this is kind of the canonical view of the mid-latitude ocean from a Jim Mohn paper, which shows, quote, the diurnal cycle of mixing in the surface layer. Uh, and I, you know, I, there's a paper you can see, but basically the sun sets, um, you get the winds often pick up, the surface cools, you get enhanced turbulent convection, uh, and epsilon, which is plotted on the left axis here, that's the turbulent parameter it enhances during nighttime hours. And then during the day, um, the stability of the surface layer uh, increases. It prevents some of that energy from getting down, and the surface epsilon tends to decrease. And that uh, cycle, in normal mid-latitude conditions, where there's some amount of wind blowing, uh, gener generally repeats. Uh, and in fact, so this is a G Jim's canonical picture. This is um, a data set collected as part of a program called SPURS in the uh, kind of mid-tropical Atlantic uh, during 2012. And you know, it's, you can see it, as long as the wind's blowing a little bit, it follows the same thing. Um, and so what we do is we put these gliders out. Um, they are similar to other gliders, uh, with the main exception being that we somewhat, oh man, this controller thing is my, there we go. Uh, we put this large payload on the top, and that payload is, um, a device for measuring turbulence microstructure. Uh, it is built by a company, you can buy it. I think folks in India have recently acquired such a system. I'm not sure uh, which institution. But um, uh, the sensors on that system are very specialized for measuring small scale fluctuations in the thermodynamics of the ocean. Uh, if you do a close up picture of what they look like, uh, this is what the, the two types of probes I tend to use uh, come, are the two flavors of shear microstructure, which is the thing that looks like a, a pen tip. And all that is is a record player needle, uh, very carefully precision mounted in an airfoil, and it works the same way a record player does. Small vibrations induced by oceanic phenomena flex that needle, and it gives a voltage. And that voltage can be calibrated uh, to a turbulent shear. And then the other common way to do it is to use a very fine scale platinum resistance thermometer. That's called an FPO7. And folks have presented, uh, there was a nice talk yesterday about Kai based, uh, um, um, Deepak gave a nice talk about uh, a methodology using those types of sensors. So we use both on the glider. Um, the thing that's special about the glider is it flies around the ocean 
profiling with depth and it collects lots of data without a human teamed uh, turbulence profiling group having to be out there. Um, and so uh, for Spurs, we did a, a project for several weeks where um, we were fortunate. We ran the glider very close to one of Tom Farrar's surface flux buoys. And so we had, <laughs> we had all the uh, surface fields up here plotted. I won't try to, this is in a paper, um, 2017 uh, with me and Sophia Merrifield, if you want to read all the details. But um, the tropical North Atlantic has uh, generally stable stratification, but during rain events, you get this freshness here. And when you get these really fresh layers, and a second thing happens, which is the winds really die down, such as they do here, uh, you get the beautiful formation of these, of these very stable layers um, for daytime hours. And uh, they have several degrees Celsius enhancements over what the typical background is. And I'll, I'm just gonna zip through this and show you a close up of one of these that we happened to catch with the glider. In fact, it was a more or less a three day period where because the winds were so absolutely minuscule and because of a freshening event that had just happened a bit earlier, the conditions were just perfect to warm up these layers. Um, and I think as Simon has pointed out, they are typically uh, three to four meters deep, such as this one, and um, generally overlooked by any kind of data set we collect. In fact, any type of uh, CTD work done from the ship would, would miss these things, generally. Uh, the way we bob the CTDs at the surface, being in the wake of the vessel, all that stuff. Um, and in fact, hulls of buoys are not great places to measure these things either. Uh, but a glider, because it's of its undisturbed upward ascent through the surface layer, uh, does this. And so the surprising thing that we thought was just wrong when we first saw it was when you actually measure dissipation rate in these layers, we found they, they each had kind of this little enhanced pocket of dissipation. And um, that made no sense to me. I typically think of stable, the more stable the water is, the less turbulence there should be. Uh, so this became the mystery studied by a, a student who uh, did their PhD in the joint program uh, and finished up about a year or so ago, uh, Alec Bognadoff. And uh, as unlikely as it seems, he seemed to find the solution in an old paper uh, by a very young Eric Tesoro which said, well, how do you get the energy into those layers when there's no wind blowing, right? I mean, that's the key. I mean, the ocean is flat, calm, and there's no wind, so it seems to contradict. And the best explanation we found was that when you modify this model, um, Eric derived in 1978, uh, for uh, kind of this tunneling phenomenon of how energy in the internal wave field from the stratified layer below can get up, and you modify it by putting another stable layer right at the surface, you can find a source of shear. Um, now, I, I point out, for those interested, there's a lengthy derivation in, in my former student's uh, thesis here. You can see he had these uh, smart people on his committee. And to, to prove how smart he was, he actually found this discrepancy in, in Eric's formulation, which, um, yeah, I mean, it was basically a factor of two error. But uh, my student was polite, so he said, I think he made some excuse up that it was uh, an assumption that clearly Eric didn't cite. Um, and uh, that's fine. I mean, we can we can talk about it that way. Uh, so if I take that data and I plot it up using um, the same methodology as Jim Mohm's paper, but now I'm only looking at cases where the wind is blowing less than three meters a second. That that just became the kind of empirical uh, differentiation. Then you can see we get this exactly out of phase trend, right? Because of these uh, enhanced near surface stable layers. Um, you actually get the most epsilon in these few cases where the wind dies down, the stable layer forms, and you trap all this epsilon near the surface. So uh, modelers would say that perhaps matters because um, if you run uh, in, in a kind of a large scale climatological simulation, the difference between canonical view of SST versus uh, these cases where you um, treat the special cases of these diurnal stable layers in kind of the tropical latitude especially, you can get something like uh, you know, five to 10 watts per meter squared difference in the flux product. And uh, this, is a, this is that same student, uh, Alec Bogdanov, uh, working with a colleague at FSU uh, to do this. So we think that might be important. We think it might be something we're missing uh, from these latitudes, such as the Bay of Bengal. So just to highlight what we've done over the last few years, um, 
which I regrettably would say we still are kind of in the proof of concept phase of learning to do turbulence uh, from gliders in the Bay of Bengal, mostly due to logistics. Uh, we did a few things in Asiri. Um, Emily helped us run a study in the middle of the basin during the winter monsoon. You can see a kind of a one week glider track right there. Uh, we were competing with a tropical cyclone, um, which ended up shortening our mission. Um, and we got a very beautiful view of the barrier layer. Um, like in the case of stray layers, the presence of the barrier layer here kind of traps the turbulence to the upper, in this case, 40 meters or so. Um, the wind was blowing hard enough that we didn't see these fancy stable layers forming. It was always blowing well above three meters per second. Um, but what we did find was a nice turbulent signature, which I think has been shown in other talks. Um, where you know below the barrier layer the mixing is actually surprisingly weak by mid-latitude standards about an order of magnitude below a lot of the mid-latitude ocean but then above that barrier layer there's a strong turbulence level that leads the diffusivities as high as uh, 10 to the minus 2 meters squared per second which is you know 100 times mid-latitude uh, values maybe a thousand times uh, more recently in 2018 uh, we um, we made a choice to deploy our glider on the transit leg, which due to some unexpected uh, shenanigans became a transit into Colombo instead of a transit into Chennai. And um, a lesson was um, don't do this again, like don't change the plan. But we did, we deployed uh, about, I don't know what latitude that is, like four degrees north or something. And uh, ended up running a, just kind of a very Southern mission, far away from the other assets of last year's program. Um, the reason I show all this stuff going on with ship traffic is something bizarre happened. I think I mentioned it at the last meeting. Where, uh, first of all, we weren't flying that well to begin with because our buoyancy ballasting was off. And then about um, a week and a half into the mission, something weird happened where we started taking off at the surface at about two knots due east. And then we abruptly turned left about a week later at speeds that defy gliding. Uh, and it, it just seems like we were stuck in some, it, we thought we might've been on a vessel, like we got captured, but the, we never were out of the water. I mean, the CTD was registering temperature and salinity. It wasn't diving, it was, it was just below the surface. And it looks like we got caught up in some kind of drifting gear. Uh, and we're not exactly sure, but it came loose and uh, Hamantha went and rescued our glider. But um, despite uh, my overdramatic disappointment and, and how that mission went. Actually, when you look at the data, we did get some good stuff. Uh, so we didn't do a lot of turbulence profiling by the standard of glide missions. But if you actually look at what we achieved before we got stuck in that drifting junk, um, we had a series of these uh, repeat cycles where we got um, you know a few dozen profiles at a time. Uh, and in fact, one of them was very nice. Uh, I think this is the one in the middle here where we capture what appears to be the the kind of Jim Moom-esque diurnal cycle. You can see here that has the day weans on toward sunset. The, uh, the turbulent layer deepens significantly down to below 60 meters. And uh, I'll get back to that in a second, but you know, you put all the data together, temperature and salinity. I, it can, looks like we came tantalizingly close to getting some stable layers. Um, I didn't plot it here, but I have a close up of the near surface where it does get quite warm during the day. The missing ingredient is because we're running the glider so far away from all other assets in the program, we just don't have any surface forcing data. So I don't have like the nice buoy that Tom Perrar provided. I don't know what the wind speed was. Although, uh, if there is a student in this room who's willing to take on a little time and is interested in turbulence, a nice project would be to grab the product data for this region. So like wind speed for sure. And like, let's see if we can figure out um, what some of these variations were by the surface forcing. And I haven't done that yet. I, I'm putting that out there. If anyone wants to take this on, it's a nice little paper they can, uh, they can take the lead on if they, if they want to rummage through the, the product data and find, find the right forcing parameters to go with this story. Uh, so just to finish, uh, you know, we're gonna, so I am kind of stepping out of this role uh, as I help Owen Arp, but uh, the lab that I work with, uh, with Justin, kind of at the lead engineer role, he is gonna move forward working with uh, others in MISOBOB uh, to put in a series of gliders measuring turbulence, uh, just like the ones I talked about. Um, this time we're gonna stick to the original plan. Even if the ship goes to a different port, we're just gonna wait till we are in the right spot. And uh, we're gonna try not to let the gliders get st stuck in any kind of floating fishing gear. 
And uh, we really want to get like 50 day records, sufficient to observe the MISO signal, which so far we have missed in these short missions. Uh, and more importantly, we want to keep the gliders near assets that are measuring the surface parameters. And we're going to get some help with that from Luca, who is giving us a bunch of mini-MET buoys, which have some MET sensing capabilities, which we will deploy initially with the gliders. And then those will eventually drift away. But by then, uh, Emily's leg of the cruise will happen. We're going to make sure the gliders are in proximity to other assets, wh which may be a combination of other gliders with surface packages like Loop or uh, the buoys. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah.